A great friend of mine currently in London is Barry Heptonstall. He has a very interesting background in enterprise sales, but more importantly, the evolution and how he now focuses on uh, early stage businesses as an investor and an advisor and a, and a mentor to those businesses. Barry, welcome. Thanks for being with us. And how's the weather like in uh, sunny London? I think you may be able to see I've got all the lights on here and uh, it's pretty grim. And uh, I'm looking out of your window behind you there and seeing beautiful sunshine in Australia. Yeah, I've got a nice sunshine coming. It's daylight savings and uh, hopefully by the end of the interview, you'll get to see the view. Um, I don't have my lighting optimized. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll make sure to rub it in. But you look great. You're, you're, you're radiating. You. Uh, you look fresh. Uh, and I think that's because you're really happy with the kind of work that you're doing and the businesses uh, that you're working with. A little bit for those that don't know uh, who you are and kind of what keeps you busy. Yeah, I've kind of fallen into doing something which I, I love doing. I say fallen into it because it's uh, it's a pivot, as we would call it in, in technology and in, in startups. Um, I spent my working career at IBM. I spent 30 years at IBM. I, I joined it originally as an engineer and moved quite quickly into sales. I, I sold a customer something and they said, you should be a salesperson. Um, and then I moved around the company, ended up running IBM's mainframe businesses and doing big deals with big clients all over the world. Um, and in parallel with that, towards the end of my time at IBM, I stumbled across the world of startups and new businesses and investing and I started putting some of the bonus I would get as a sales director at IBM. I started investing it into those very, very early stage businesses. And that was like a little thread that I pulled and I just kept pulling it and pulling it and pulling it. And I'm now 12 years into doing that. Um, and I've got about 60 or 70 investments that I've done that tracked in the world's biggest spreadsheet, as I call it. And, um, I'm now at the point where I can look at a portfolio and start to be able to really assess how things have been going. So it's going well so far. That's awesome. I want to draw upon that experience um, at a large multinational working with a very particular type of skill set. You know, when you're selling mainframe computers, enterprise sales, it's, it's a very high price point, touch point. Um, you, you wrote an article recently about uh, the customer's customer and that journey in business about understanding what you're selling and, and who you're selling to. Let's touch on that before we go into startups and how to make yourself investable and kind of the lessons that you can share. What did you mean by the customer's customer and that, that whole philosophy? It was, it was a very big lesson to me fairly early on in my career at IBM that IBM would sell to their customer and they would be looking at things like, how can we influence the customer's cost? How can we reduce their cost of operations of their IT department by deploying our technology? Um, sometimes it might involve reducing headcount or not hiring additional people because our computers were more efficient to run. Um, that, that was, that's the, I would call that a basic level of selling where you are creating a business case which is mainly about cost reduction but actually what IBM taught me just by the way that people spoke about their customers was they were always interested in the customer's business. How could we help the customers with their business? So one of my early jobs was in IBM's banking division. Um, I was looking after one of the UK's biggest banks at the time. And they put me through City University, through some courses at, at the City University about banking. They taught me about banking, nothing to do with computers. The courses were all about the business of banking. Um, and that was because IBM realized that, yes, you can help customers to reduce their costs and to be more efficient. And that's kind of good. And that's a superficial way of selling to them, um, a superficial way of, of working with them. But if you're going to have a real partnership, then what you want to do is help your customer with their business. And if you can help your customer with their customers in terms of increasing their sales or being able to make their offering much more compelling, um, then that's a much more, that's more of a partnership. That's much more of a, of a, of a long-term strategic kind of relationship that you can develop. 
I can give you an example if you want, actually, yeah, if that helps. Yeah. Yeah. So to towards the end of my career, actually, I worked with Visa. Um, and this is all public knowledge, so I'm not saying anything that's, that's secret. Um, and Visa, are very, um, for, for very many years, were competing against MasterCard. MasterCard were Visa's enemy number one and vice versa. A little bit of American Express and Diners Club. But really, it was Visa versus MasterCard. And everything that Visa was doing was about MasterCard. Until we hit upon the idea of doing contactless payments. Now, to be able to do that, you have to be able to handle tens of thousands of transactions per second through your IT system. When you bip your Visa card by tapping it on the little box, um, it needs to respond to you within a second, within a fraction of a second. And those messages travel halfway across the world, um, potentially to America or here in Europe to the UK. Um, I still call this Europe. So 40 countries around Europe um, are running off our computer, Visa's computer they bought from IBM um, in the UK. And that thing's handling tens of thousands of transactions, tens of thousands of people simultaneously bipping their card at the same time. Um, and in that partnership of building out those systems and being able to, to help Visa with the challenge of, of scaling uh, the number of transactions, we were able to help Visa to compete with cash. So it turned out that MasterCard wasn't really the competitor for Visa, it was cash. Um, and as we've seen over the years since, cash has become less and less of a transaction. I think I bought a, a banana a few days ago that was about 85 UK pence. So that's, what is that in, in Australian dollars, like $1.50 or something. You know, so we're talking about almost micro transactions that people are now handling on the Visa card. And yet when you bip it on the machine, it responds in a fraction of a second. And there are actually all kinds of, sorry. Yeah, that's really interesting because, you know, you, you just provide a really great practical example of how intimate knowledge is really important to be able to sit on the same side of the table as your customer um, and, and, and build a genuine partnership as opposed to sitting on the other side and, and, and being a, a counterparty to a transaction. How ingrained was that in the organization? Was that an exception to your division or was that a culture and for those that haven't worked uh, in large multinationals, in, in sales and large multinationals, or was that a, a corporate-wide culture? It was definitely an IBM culture. I can't speak about other other companies, but it was definitely an IBM culture. So the, the whole company was structured to support this. So the way that they did it was account executives, account directors who had a customer like I did for one of the UK banks at one point, um, and then product people whose job was to be an expert in a product, not necessarily in an industry, but an expert in a particular piece of technology. So I did both those jobs. I did the, the specific industry, banking, look after a big UK bank, and then later on in my career, I really specialized in the product side of things with these big servers. How and then what IBM would do would be form teams of people that would work together mm. on projects. How did that, I think you may have answered it, but how did that culture evolve over time? So you'd been there for, for a while. Um, so from the time you started to the time you left, how did that intimacy with the customer, that understanding that culture of sitting on the right side of the table evolve? I think um, I think it was always there. To be honest, even from when I joined, there was always this. Um, there was always the focus on customers and what can we do to help them with their business. But one of the things the company did do later on was start to put more and more senior people onto the biggest customers, um, and really have people that are like C level people. Um, IBM called them managing directors looking after the biggest clients. So Visa had a managing director, Unilever had a managing director, Citibank had a managing director, Barclays had a managing director. All of the biggest accounts would have somebody that was basically the same level as the person running the UK, which is a which at the time was a 20,000 person company. They might have 10 people working for them if you're directly for them, um, but they're the same kind of rank in the organization as the UK chief exec. So really what that was, was a statement to everybody of, Customers are important, they're critical. Um, and I certainly understood that because many of my clients in our mainframe business had been clients since the 1960s. Behind me, if anyone's watching on YouTube, they'll see that um, I've got a painting of a 1964 computer 
we had customers that wrote code in the 1960s and were still running it in the 2020s. Wow. Which is, uh, which is amazing. Now you're seeing this throughout your career and then you're going out growing into the startup investing stage. Um, these are early companies. These are early stage. They're not late stage. How are you using this culture, this insight and applying it to small, let's call them smaller businesses or smaller enterprises. What are the similarities or the opportunities to take that big business uh, culture and apply it to something small as it grows? Well, they're really very, very different. So the, the, you, you were saying before that these were expensive things. I mean, one of these computers is 10 million pounds. So you could be spending on a contract, if you're a, a huge global bank, hundreds of millions um, or an individual contract to buy all of the technology. The, at the other end of the spectrum, many of the investments I've made have been in two people, two people that have decided they're going to start a business. Um, and I think I've always loved business. I, I did a computer science degree originally, um, but and, and I've always been interested in technology. But really what I love is the application of technology to businesses. And that's really the thing, that's the thread, if you like, that's run through run through my life, my working life and studying as well. Um, how do you take this thing and apply it? Build a computer, fine, but what's it useful for? What can you actually make it do? Um, and so working with, the, working with startups, really what I did was um, in my sector, which is technology investing, specifically really technology investing, um, you very often, typically, you might have two nerds who have done computer science and they start a company, but they don't know a lot about business. So because I had a lot of kind of general business experience from being a, a senior manager at IBM, um, I was able to bring them general, what you what you would consider, Peter, to be common sense um, ideas, but also specifically some expertise around sales. So what are you building? Why is the customer going to use it? And how are they going to get value from the thing that you are building? That's really the conversation that I was having with those and still have with those early stage companies. For those of you that don't know, Barry is, uh, I've been one of those geeks uh, sitting opposite uh, Barry, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully not too geeky, uh, but my business no. partner, Dom and I about five years ago uh, sat opposite Barry in London. Uh, we were there. Uh, I actually made a promise to him and I said, I want to make sure that we are the best company that, that you invest in. Uh, and I haven't forgot that promise and we're, and we're working on it. Right? We've had a pandemic and we've had ups and downs, but um, I want to go to the point of um, that's for wealthy, by the way, a business that Dom and I, my business partner, uh, started together and today is focusing on the Latin American investment market. Uh, we've got a great. Yeah, thank you for letting me do that. Yeah, no, thank you for, for backing us and, and thank you for, um, having confidence in us and giving us that ability to then go on and, and, and do these great things. Um, what do you look for? How does a, a business person um, make themselves investable? What are the ingredients? What are the things that you need at the early stage? And what are the myths that can be ignored? Well, one of the nice things about being an angel investor is I get to make up the rules. Other investors, venture capitalists or um, other corporate investors, perhaps from their corporate departments, have to fit a lot of rules and they have to you know, meet certain criteria before they can put money into a business. When you're an angel you, and you're investing your own money, you can do whatever you like. So um, I've tried to put some rules in or maybe some guardrails around what I will and won't do. Um, and across that portfolio of investments, I've got some that have done very well some that are doing very well, um, some that are very early stage. It's too early to judge them, really. And a few that haven't worked out. Um, and the main thing the main thing I would say, and I think probably most investors would agree on this one as the number one criteria, is that you back the team. You back the, you back the rider. You back the jockey. Um, and the reason for that partly is, especially when you're investing in early stage companies, you actually don't really know. I think there's a, a line in, in the movie Social Network, we don't know what it is yet about, about Facebook. And that's really true about 
small startups. We don't know what it is yet. Um, and companies pivot, as as you've done at Wealthy, to focus more specifically on, on Latin American investors. Um, but those pivots happen because you as founders go on a journey and it's a journey which along with me might be a 10-year journey as an investor um, or 12-year journey. And as you go on the journey, you're you're learning stuff about the marketplace. You're learning about your customers. You're learning about your customers' customers and you're, you're figuring out what works, what doesn't work. And so to be able to do that, you really need to have a really good team. Um, and I, I always say team because it's sometimes it's two founders, sometimes it's two founders and their initial hires. Maybe they've got six or eight people in the business. So let me peel back on that. What do you mean by the jockey? So what are the actual qualities in the team that are standouts for you? Or is it just intuition? Does it just come down to your gut? There's a there's a little bit. I mean, you can, some people, and I have a little bit of this in me, um, back people who go to fancy universities because if you're smart enough to get into Oxford or Cambridge or MIT or Caltech um, or Harvard then you're probably pretty smart um, and there's a little bit of that on me, in me so there, there are certain criteria that you would just look at and say okay this is interesting there's somebody who's got themselves into that but that's not enough what I'm really wanting to do is as I think I did with you and Dom look in someone's eyes and see a fire and a passion and a relentless will to win that you are going to make this thing a success. And that is a that is subjective, um, purely subjective. It's listening to what people say. Um, I'm one of those, I think I'm an INTJ on the on the score. So I'm a J, I'm a judging person, um, which helps a lot when you're investing. So I judge people, I look at them and I think, are they going to give up? when it gets hard, because it's hard on every startup's journey, um, will they give up or are they going to be relentless? Are they going to keep on going because they want to make this a success? So that's that's one of the key things. Um, but there are lots of other little signs, little tells. Sometimes investors talk about making bets, placing bets. It's not really betting. I suppose it's akin to betting. It's I don't bet. I don't do the lottery. I, do, I put $2 in the million dollar slot machine in Vegas. That was my entire betting the, the one time I went there. Um, so, but you, but you are betting on startups. Um, so I look for little tells like you might have in poker, things like attention to detail. Do the, do the, does the company produce really nice quality stuff? You know, whether that's an email or a YouTube video or, um, the way that it writes to its own staff internally. If I get copied on something, I, I read it all. I look for spelling mistakes. I know this might sound trivial, but it's an attention to detail, which actually, if you look at the world's greatest corporations, they have that attention to detail. Um, and it, it shows up in little ways and it could show up in big ways. Um, I, also, I also think that that attention to detail, it, it just says something about the people that they care mm. and that it matters that they do a real quality job. So in the case of Wealthy, if I picked on one thing, the YouTube videos that you do when you go and visit a site, when you go and visit buildings and walk around with the branding and um, some of the presentations and stuff that Dom's done over the years where he's talked about a development in an area and he's flipping through the screens to show here's the distance to the CBD, here's the development they're going to make on the edge of the city where there's going to be a new sports park. All of that stuff is just done to such a high level of quality. Um, so it's those kind of characteristics that I'm looking for. I think one of the best uh, pieces of advice I took from a Netflix cooking show uh, that I was watching with my wife once didn't come out of business school didn't come out of textbooks it was uh, an Italian chef and he was a pizza maker and his words of advice were whatever you do in life do it with passion and mm -hmm. if I was to put a label on what you just said it's that passion if you're going to do something do it properly do it with your heart 
because when you do whether it's right or wrong it makes commercial sense that's not the point the point is you're invested in the process and if you want to be investable if you want to invite people into your business you need to share that passion with them so they know where you stand what is i of- love when somebody is building a business because yeah. they've seen something in the world that's broken or missing and they have to fix it they mm-hmm. they just have to they have to fix it so if that's somebody's grandmother that can't get elder care at home and you have to you know she can't get it in her district and someone's creating a business to solve that that problem for their own grandmother and for other people's grandmothers i love that kind of passion where someone's seen something that's broken and they they want to fix it i think that's exactly right i mean the reason why dom and i um change the name of the business so when you came on board we, we changed the name of the business when we sat down and we yes. thought why be passionate about what we're doing we really had strong reasons we had independent family reasons why we wanted to help people create wealth and we called the business wealthy um, and you know that that's part of the package we're talking today because i have an intimate desire to help people that are on a similar journey to what we were uh, to 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 become better and and you know that that goes to your point about that passion that IBM mentality that mentality in that way of doing things properly and with attention to detail um, what are red flags what are the things or some of the myths if you haven't taken external capital you're running a good business you're thinking about growing you've heard different things as you said there's different rules and this different arenas to play in what are some myths that you believe early stage founders need to take out of the equation? Uh, The most important one of all is don't BS people. Tell the truth. If you've got, if you've got a hundred users and five customers who are paying, don't say I've got a hundred (laughs) customers. Say I've got a hundred users, which is fine. And I've got five customers, which is also fine. I mean, early stage companies, you start with one and then you get two and then before you know it, you've got hundreds. Um, so I like people who are really straight, who say, this is where we're at. This is where we're going to get to. And I like that to be believable. So one of the things I ask people to do sometimes is do me your, show me, show me your business model spreadsheet for the next whatever, three years um, and show me a low, medium, high the high being if everything goes well and the low being if everything doesn't go well. Um, And the reason I do that is because I want to understand people's rationale. So how are they thinking? Um, And I want people to be straight with me to say, look, if this, this, and this happens, we're going to get the high scenario. But if only one of those three things happens, we're going to be at the the low scenario. Um, And I want people to be able to explain that in a way that's logical and clear and honest. I just, that that matters quite a lot. Um, and actually, to be fair, in, in the world of tech startups, people are very, very straight. They actually, I very rarely encounter huge issues. Um, I actually don't want to be sold to, par- paradoxically, as, a, as someone who spent most of his career in sales. Um, I don't want to be sold to, I want to be told clearly, because this is a 10 or 12 year partnership. Um, don't, don't start it off on the wrong foot by saying something that isn't correct or isn't true or that's so hugely exaggerated that you can't possibly um, achieve it. And, think- and by the way, investors are smart. I'm not yeah. speaking about myself necessarily. As generally as a population, they tend to be pretty smart people, especially if they've done a lot, they've seen it all. And what I do, and I'm sure others do too, is kind of pattern match. Mm -hmm. So you were saying, what do I look for? Sometimes I say, oh, Peter, he's just like Diego at Krahana. And I I kind of, I look to to pattern match a little bit. Um, So I'm constantly assessing, I'm judging. I think one of the good things about being a good salesperson uh, is that you know when you're being sold to. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's a pleasant experience. We don't mind being sold to when you're being sold something good. And sometimes it's a it's a not so pleasant experience because you can smell the lies and you can smell the BS. Uh, and so that's that's really great advice. Um, you see a lot of deals. 
Uh, I know you do. I know you pass on a lot of deals. I know you're involved in a lot of deals. Um, to put a bow on this conversation, and we have to get you back to explore some more of the topics, but uh, I want to know what are you interested in? What are you fascinated? That's that's probably a more passionate word. Uh, what are you fascinated by at the moment? And where do you uh, want to be investing in the next five years? What's really caught your eye and what are you really excited about? Well, I suppose I'm going to give you the, the obvious answer, which is AI. We've all been absolutely astounded, even those people like me that have got a computer science background, we've all been astounded by the sudden step up that, that's been made in AI. Um, and when I look at my portfolio of investments, there is not enough AI. There is some, which is great. Um, and quite a lot of the companies I've invested in are are using, starting to use AI. Um, but there aren't enough that have AI really at the core of what they're doing. Um, and this thing is here, whether we like it or not. Some people like it, some people don't. I want to make sure that my portfolio contains a lot of AI because that is the future. Explain to me what you mean by at the core. And 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 this is an important point I've picked up on it because I know for you it's a priority. What does at the having AI at the core mean as opposed to a business that is using AI to do something else? How does the core work for you? At the core really means that they've developed some piece of technology that's defensible, that's unique. So not just asking a question of chat GPT, formatting it nicely and presenting it through your through your interface on your website, but actually something that's unique core technology specific to you. And that there's actually a relatively easy way to, to assess that. It's by understanding who in the company is building that technology and what's their background and what skills do they have. So um, a recent investment of mine is a company that sounds kind of boring, but it's incredible what they do. They're cleaning spreadsheets for the insurance industry, but they've got a team of developers, engineers, who are all machine learning graduates. They all went to university together or to the same university. They've all got degrees in machine learning. They're all experts at this thing. And so they're building core technology, which is able to... Um, work in a fundamentally different way to what chat GPT would do if you were to try and apply it to the task. Having seen the evolution of the mainframe computer into personal computers, into tablets, into smartphones, into AI today, what to you as an investor is the most important AI bucket to play in? If, if we're talking about at the core, is it having IP around the language model itself because we're seeing a lot of those come out now you had chat gpt you've got llama from facebook and every day there's new language models coming out is it the data set and you have your own ip and, and data into how you can train those language models and be agnostic or is it the commercialization which is still kind of missing you've got some great ideas in category one and two but how do you make money and how do you charge for it if you had to pick one as your preference as an angel investor, I'll put you on the spot. Uh, with your experience, which one's the most important? I would love to have the money to invest in OpenAI or one of the large um, language model developers. In reality, what I'm trying to do is pick off niches. So I'm trying to look and say, um, is, there a, is there a niche here in cleaning insurance spreadsheets? And is there value to the customer in terms of doing that for them? Um, is there a value in pr producing a, an AI system for tax accountants to understand the 18,000 pages or whatever the UK tax rules are? Um, is there a, an advantage in using AI to help independent financial advisors to produce reports for their clients? It's picking a niche for me. Um, I, as an angel, typically don't get tens of billions outcome. I've got one at Unicorn that I've, I was lucky enough to back. Um, I'm interested in owning one or 2% of a business that ends up being worth 100 million. That is a lot of money to me as an ordinary person. So those tend to be niche businesses. They tend to be the ones where the big companies like Google won't go because it's not worth it for them. 
a market for tax accountants in the UK is too niche and too small. And yet it still is a market of hundreds of millions. So it sounds of thousands like, of people and hundreds of millions of revenue. For sure. It might be it might be an exit to a zero or an accounting platform or or someone else, right? Correct. It doesn't need to be uh, a trillion dollar business. So it sounds like um to, to wrap and for anybody watching this, building an AI business uh, that is looking for an angel investor, um, it sounds Call like me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm selling you now, right? I've turned into I've turned into a sales. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, but it sounds like what you're saying is bring me a business, bring me a use case with value. Let There has to be a commercial use case. If you're not making money today, you can make money in the future, but there needs to be a business. Correct. But I want it to have something, a secret source at its core, not just a bit of fluff around an old business. The combination of those two coming together gives you that chance of a X billion uh, exit multiplied by the the stake that you have in. Correct. Yes, exactly that. Awesome. Well, Barry, amazing insights. Uh, great conversation. Thank you very much for being, first of all, generous with your time. And secondly, generous with your insights. Any final advice uh, for entrepreneurs out there building and thinking about the future? Yeah, I mean, my, my comment would be, I think that two most important things you can do in life are doing something with children, looking after your own children, or if you've got a nephew or a niece, some having children in your life and being kind and generous to them. Um, and the other one is creating jobs, creating jobs for people, even if it's just you for yourself as a, you know, if you're a one man or one woman business. Um, but if you can employ other people, it's one of the most important things I think that you can do for society. So uh, give it a go. Give it a give it a try. Um, worst case scenario, you'll learn a lot. Best case scenario, you'll enjoy a lot of success. Awesome, great advice, great words. Uh, on the next podcast, we'll touch a little bit about the wedding business. Uh, we didn't go into that, but you've taught no. me <laughs> taught me some great great uh, insights into that. But thanks again, Barry, and uh, good luck with the upcoming uh, London winter. Thank you very much. I'll need it. Thank you.